Welcome to the 56th seminar in the Global Health History Seminar Series. This is the seventh year of this seminar. Welcome to all our uh, participants here in Geneva today and those listening over the web. Our first speaker today is Professor Judith Shapiro, who is the director of the Global Environmental Politics Program at the American University School of International Service in Washington, D.C. Professor Shapiro is the author or co-author of four, soon to be five, books on China and numerous articles. A documentary film inspired by her book, Mao's War Against Nature, is to be released this fall. Despite not coming from the public health world, she's kindly agreed to participate in this series and to be seconded by Dr. Carlos Dora, who's our second speaker. Dr. Dora is a medical epidemiologist and the coordinator of interventions for healthy environments here at WHO in the Department of Protection for the Human Environment. His work focuses on the environmental health impacts of non-health sector policies. This includes health impact assessments and environmental health risk government. For those of you who haven't attended before, the way this seminar works is the two speakers present. And then my co-chair, Professor David Clayton from York University, will moderate your questions, a question and answer session for both speakers after the second speaker is finished. Please note that this seminar is broadcast live over the web as well as being recorded. All statements and questions are made in the personal capacity of the speakers. And uh, please, for the quality of the recording, use your microphones. Um, thank you very much. Professor Shapiro. Hello, everyone. It's a huge honor for me to be here. Um, I accepted this invitation with pleasure although I wasn't quite sure it was intended for me initially because I'm not a public health person. But I'm a China person and a China environment person, so I'm going to leave it to all of you to make some of those public health connections that I'm sure you will want to make. Now, you've been promised um, a personal perspective, so perhaps I'll talk to you just a little bit about my very, very first memories of living in China. I first visited China in 1977, which was hugely early, right after the death of Chairman Mao. Uh, I went there to live and teach in 1979. In those days, I was considered to be a distinguished foreign expert, and so they gave me an air conditioner. Every time I turned on the air conditioner, all the electricity in the university went off. So that gives you a bit of perspective. In those days, the only heating was a kind of coal-fired brick that um, emitted carbon monoxide. And you had to have the windows open all the time in order to use this brick, even if it was freezing out. So China has changed hugely. Um, tens of thousands of cars are added to the streets every year. A new coal-fired power plant is built every week. Uh, China is reaching worldwide for the resources that the government needs in order to guarantee uh, certain kinds of basic security for the people. Food security, energy security are huge issues. On the one hand, the Chinese people want legitimately to live as well as those in the developed world, which is their right. On the other hand, if every Chinese person lived as wastefully as we do, in the developed world, we would need many planets. Moreover, the Chinese middle class is starting to ask questions about the development that is causing them to choke on growth. Black skies and rivers, traffic jams so severe that it's almost impossible to get from one place to another, trees covered with dust, crippled with acid rain, entire towns known as cancer villages, social unrest, and protests over pollution are starting to challenge the legitimacy of the government, even as the government strives to continue its path of growth in order to maintain power. 
As we seek to understand the global implications of China's environmental problems, we should remember that the developed world has, in effect, displaced environmental harms as the Chinese are bearing the brunt of the pollution used to manufacture goods that are consumed in the West. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to be drawing on two books. So I have a lot of material. I may not get through all of it. Um, one of the books is a new textbook that hasn't been published yet called China's Environmental Challenges, and it's focused on the current situation. The other is this book, uh, Mao's War Against Nature, which provides a historical perspective. So I'm going to try to give us just a taste of some of the transboundary implications of China's environmental problems. I'm also going to give us a taste of the severity of these problems and their connection to public health, and with, with some comments on the limitations of Chinese civil society in trying to deal with those problems. I'm also going to try to give you a bit of a historical perspective on the problems, focusing on the Mao years, and present this search for sustainable development as related to a question of national identity. And finally, I'm going to reflect on what the future may hold. And Carlos may have to take me off by that point. So, OK. So here's just a few things. I think I'm not going to give you a lot of statistics. I'm sure you're all scientists and you're great at statistics. But I'm going to run down just a couple of transboundary implications of China's enormous growth. Um, particulate air pollution from China has been measured in Canada and the western United States, um, as well as a lot of mercury de deposition. Okay, so that's a huge uh, reminder of the fact that environmental issues do not respect national boundaries. Uh, the dams that China is building on the upper reaches of some of the rivers that have their headquarters in the Tibetan Plateau are influencing relations with um, all, virtually all of China's neighbors have tensions over transboundary water courses with China. Um, the China's, Chinese people's growing appetite for exotic meats, like uh, pangolin and uh, tiger bones, it's all related to the traditional Chinese medicine tradition, which it seems to believe that by eating an animal, you acquire that animal's fierceness or virility or longevity or whatever. It's a huge problem for biodiversity. Uh, since the 1998 Yangtze River floods, when logging was banned in the upper reaches of the river, the deforestation in other parts of the world has spiked dramatically, particularly in some of the weak or corrupt governments of Burma or Cambodia, also very much in um, far eastern Russia. And these are primarily to feed an appetite for furniture um, in the West. So if you really look at where does that Home Depot patio furniture come from, you'll find that it's very difficult to trace the logs because commodity chain analysis is really tough in this kind of situation. Finally, and most importantly, um, well, not finally, but almost <laughs> very importantly, China has overtaken the U.S. as the largest emitter of carbon dioxide. And uh, even though its per capita emissions are still fairly low, together with other developing countries, China argues that its survival emissions should not be compared to the luxury emissions of the developed world, which is a great point. Um, however, even China's per capita emissions are now starting to spike, and in per capita terms, uh, China's CO2 emissions are now quite high. Um, I guess finally for international um, issues, China's investment in oil, gas, and minerals fuels environmentally destructive activities in places as far flung as Central Asia, Ecuador, Sudan, Iran. Chinese foreign aid programs often facilitated such extraction by carving roads into wilderness and across deserts, bringing development into fragile ecosystems and contributing to the current great wave of global species extinctions. That's just a taste. Let's turn to the question of domestic severity. What is it like for the Chinese people? The World Bank uh, country database for China shows that 20 of the world's 30 most polluted cities are in China. Uh, air pollution, as you know, is a huge problem. 
the World Resources Institute found that TSP and SO2, which are both produced by burning coal, have far exceeded WHO guidelines in the majority of um, Chinese cities. Lung diseases such as tuberculosis and cancer are so prevalent that Chinese cancer villages are widely documented. There are something like 459 cancer villages documented in 29 of China's 31 provinces by 2010. Severe water pollution affects 75% of China's rivers and lakes and 90% of urban groundwater, such that a lot of water is unsuitable even for agricultural use. Um, I said I wouldn't give you a lot of statistics, but a 2007 OECD study found that hundreds of millions of Chinese people drink water contaminated by arsenic, fluoride, untreated wastewater, fertilizers, and pesticides. Water stress, the falling aquifers in North China threatened to create huge numbers of displaced people. If you want to call them refugees, you can. Sea level rise, increased droughts and floods. Um, the North already has 60% of the cropland, but only 16% of the water. Um, but falling aquifers in North China mean that the Yellow River sometimes doesn't go all the way to the sea. So, given the severity of these and other entrenched problems such as deforestation, erosion, desertification, heavy metal pollution, salinization, loss of arable land, acid rain, biodiversity loss, and so on, China's government's handling of its environmental crisis has become of critical importance to the country's stability and the legitimacy of the government. Indeed, the nation's environmental challenges are so severe and so central to the manner in which China will rise that it is no exaggeration to say that they cannot be separated from its national identity and ability to provide for the Chinese people. Environmental protests are triggering state concerns about broader unrest. Environmental mass incidents over local pollution are estimated to number 5,000 per year. Many of these involve only a small number of people, but other, and they are resolved in a matter of hours, but others involve thousands of people and involve shutting down entire cities. So what is the historical and cultural context in which China is trying to achieve sustainable development, and how does this context affect the prospects for success? At least in rhetoric, the, China's, the Chinese government's stated public commitment to sustainable development is very clear. Implement, implementation shortfalls notwithstanding, the government has integrated sustainability into the five-year plans, passed new laws mandating a national renewable energy portfolio, poured lots of money into green belt projects and clean air and water initiatives, and participated actively in global discussions of global environmental problems. However, the prospects for achieving sustainable development are clouded by a political system that restricts public participation in environmental decision making, a political culture of insecurity and uncertainty at a time of enormous economic growth and social change. In a way, we could think of China, this is a little bit of a crude characterization, but as being in the grip of a superiority-inferiority complex. Because on the one hand, the Chinese people remember very well that they are the middle kingdom, that the world came to pay tribute, that they created gunpowder and paper and spaghetti, although that's not true, and um, but, but, but the, you know, that they were really you know, a great, great civilization well before Europe um, rose. And yet they also remember very vividly the centuries of humiliation at the hands of foreign powers, from the opium wars to the carving up of the coastal areas to later the humiliation at the hands of the Japanese, the warlordism, the years of civil war in which the KMT and the CCP fought each other and there was tremendous suffering. And so in a way we can understand China at this moment as trying to reassert its position in global history. They want to come back to getting the respect that they feel, not to you know, characterize everybody at once, but there's a sense that the world should give China its respect. And if anything, this focus on what we would call face in Chinese, the, 
is exacerbated by a Confucian tradition which emphasizes hierarchy, so that in your relationship with other people, you're always either above them or below them. And if you're above them, in some way you have obligations to take care of them. So you know, social harmony rests on everyone knowing what their place is and performing that role correctly. But China is very, very sensitive to issues of face. Here are some examples of how we can see this preoccupation um, with face. The delirium of national happiness when China was awarded the 2008 Olympics after many failed bids. And that helps explain the government's nervousness on opening night. And they got all the song and dance troops from the whole country to rehearse for a year ahead of time to make the greatest opening night ceremonies ever. And they seeded the clouds a few days ahead of time to get rid of all the rain so that the opening night ceremonies wouldn't be spoiled by the rain. And you, know, you can imagine any country that gets the Olympics, they want to make a good show. But there was, this was an intensity that was unusual, shall we say. Um, the focus on reputation and status plays into China's desire to build the world's tallest, fanciest, most innovative and expensive buildings, the fastest trains, the longest bridges, the most modern airport. It contributes to the emphasis on putting a man on the moon at a time when rural education is in sharp decline and income inequalities are more severe than ever. So surely the quest for national pride also helps explain China's determination to build the Three Gorges Dam at a time when many developing nations are rethinking these mega dams as um, maybe not so smart because they dramatically alter the national environment, uh, the, 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 uh, the watershed. Preoccupation with face may also motivate some of China's behavior towards Taiwan in international forums. China, as you all well know, blocked a seat for Taiwan in the WHO, even though Taiwan was the center of a major SARS outbreak in 2003. And that's all related to you know, concern with face. So we're going to turn now to my specialty, the Mao years, <laughs> which is um, I don't know how many China specialists there are here. How many of you are? Some of you are Chinese people, I can see. But um, how many Chinese people do we have in here? Hello to the Chinese people. <laughs> Hello to the Chinese people. OK. But let me just remind you that the, the history of the Mao period you know, starts in 1949, and the Chinese people are told they're the luckiest people alive because Chairman Mao says the Chinese people have stood up, and he stands in front of the gate of Tiananmen and, and says, you know, the Chinese people have stood up and patriotic Chinese people come back from all around the world to help build a new China. And it's a really wonderful moment in Chinese history, a time of great hope. But then things start to go bad um, because people always say China, uh, that Chairman Mao was a great soldier, but he didn't understand development. And so very early on, we can talk about the anti-rightist movement in which um, some of the very patriotic intellectuals who were told they should criticize China were labeled as rightists and silenced. Among them was a famous demographer named Mayan Chu, and he said the Chinese people are getting to be too numerous, and for his pains they shut him up because China wanted to have, as well Mao said, with many people, strength is great. Uh, and they said, every mouth has two hands. So, the notion was we should have as many people as possible. Also, in this period, um, soon after the anti rightist movement in 1957 came the Great Leap Forward. And I'm going to show you, because the footage is so wonderful, a clip from this documentary that is coming out. It's called Waking the Green Tiger. And this is a clip that shows, during the Great Leap Forward, the campaign against the four pests. And with a huge level of social organization, every single child and every single adult is made to come out and let's, where's Katie? Let's show the videotape. Um, yeah, and let's hit the lights. We show up, it's about five, uh, six minutes, and I'm not sure that the people in the webinar can see this, so we're going to show it without sound, and I'm going to continue to talk. 
as we show this. This is Chu Guping. He is considered to be the father of Chinese environmentalism. He's a very high-ranking leader, and he's remembering the Mao years and the intensity with which Mao wanted to catch up with the industrial world, and he asked everybody to work together to um, get rid of these pests, but also to smelt backyard furnaces. Uh, where people were told to bring their pots and pans out and melt them down in the backyard so as to show that China's steel output could be as great as that of the, um, the British. But this is Yuan Di Shengtian, which is man, man, man must conquer nature. And this is the ethos of the period, man must conquer nature. The notion that somehow through um, mobilization and human effort, we can throw away the laws of science and overcome all of the obstacles to development. So Chi Jinping says the party had little experience building a new society, and so they made mistakes. This is uh, people smelting the backyard furnaces. Almost anybody alive during 1958 to 60 remembers these very amateurish kinds of furnaces that they were made to build. And I mean, they, it's, it's almost humorous because they were told to bring out their pots and pans and all these useful things and melt them down. So in war, he turned everyone to soldiers, and then he tried to use them to smelt these uh, furnaces. That's the first great deforestation. We hear about three great deforestations, three great waves of deforestation. And here, the people go to the hillsides to cut down the trees in order to smelt these backyard furnaces. So this peasant, this farmer, remembers that there used to be lots of trees here when he was young, and there used to be wolves living in the forest. But they cut them all down. And it was um, you know, a moment of optimism. And then once I gave a talk, I don't know how many of you know the US well, but I gave a talk once in Pittsburgh, which is the center of the American steel industry. And when I told them about this episode of the Mao period, they were rolling on the floors laughing because you can't the heat wouldn't have been great enough to make anything usable. Yeah. As we're watching this footage, I'm going to read a poem which captures the essence of the war on nature. It's just a typical poem from that period. Let's attack here, drive away the mountain gods, break down the stone walls to bring out those 200 million tons of coal. Let's strike here. Let the dragon king change his job. Let the river climb the hills. Let the valley open its bosom, cut down the knoll to make a plain over there. Let's make war on the great earth. Let the mountains and rivers surrender under our feet, march on nature, and take over the power of rain and wind. We shall not tolerate a single inch of unused land, nor a single place that's not, or a single place harassed by disaster. We'll make wet rice, wheat, and yellow corn grow on the top of the mountains, and beans, peanuts, and red galliang rise on the sheer rocks. The videotape has now turned to the topic of the war on the four pests. And um, Mao decided that sparrows were eating the grain. So every single child who was alive at that time was told to come out of school and bang on the pots and pans so that the sparrows had nowhere to light. And it's incredible to think that that many people could actually eradicate the sparrows. But Many people I interviewed said that the following year, after this campaign, they couldn't 
We used to have sparrows on a stick as a local delicacy. They couldn't buy it anymore. And even today, the sparrows are just starting to come back. The other pests were... <laughs> <laughs> she said, I don't know what the spells did to piss off him and now. <laughs> the spells were exhausted. They fell from the sky. It's a little almost like the story of the passenger pigeon in the United States. You'd think there's so many that it would be impossible to eradicate them. In some cases, they put poison in the only places they let them land. But a lot of times, they just fell down dead from tiredness. Hmm. Here's the other pests of flies, mosquitoes, and mice. I she feel sorry for the sparrows. There's just a little more of this footage, but I think it's incredible to see this documentary of this moment of sort of man's mistaken notion see later of course it turned out that the sparrows in addition to eating a little bit of grain the sparrows ate a lot of the insects that then flourished and destroyed a lot of the grain. Look at that quantity of birds being taken away. It was a time of madness. Man was supposed to conquer nature so there could be a great leap forward. But I think that many of you, I think this, I can, we can stop the tape now, I guess. Oh no, there's one more moment, one more moment. We have to say that back then, our party was good at winning wars, but not as good at development. Mm. Okay. And there was poor leadership. And sometimes, you know, we, my students dream of the day when we could have, you know, they're so worried about global environmental degradation that they dream of the day that some leader could come in and you know, they feel very frustrated with the American political process, for example. We're unable to get any climate change legislation passed. And they think, well, if we only have a really strong leader, you know, we talk about eco-authoritarianism, and that would be the answer. But the problem is, you know, what happens when the leader is wrong? And, um, <laughs> and I think that the Mao period provides a very dramatic example of what happens when man and nature are pitted against each other. Now, Let's say that the Chinese is just a cautionary tale. This period is just a cautionary tale. And a lot of the rest of the world is doing the same thing. Modernization campaigns are the same worldwide. OK. Carlos is giving me the eye. OK, no, it's working out. It's working out. I'm going to um, turn away from this historical period and just say, that some of the themes of this period are still very much alive and well in China today. Among them, political repression of activists who are um, fighting to try to close down factories, um, the state's willingness to reorder society for its own good, uh, all of the forcible relocations for the big dams or for the south-north water transfer um, is a very mu much alive and well. And also the urgency with which um, society is changing. In this case, capitalism seems to be a worse, a worse enemy than socialism. So this is not a question of political system, but rather I would say a question of lack of political participation, lack of information, um, lack of um, intellectual freedom. Today China is engaged in a quest to reassert its historic great power status, transforming urban landscapes, still conquering nature with mega projects, engaging beyond its borders in ways to in, designed to inspire notice and respect. Yet in the nationwide push for modernization, sustainability and social justice often fall by the wayside. 
During the past 30 plus years, China's economic growth and participation in global affairs have created some of the most dramatic social and economic changes ever to occur in a single country in a short time. The prize of global respect is, in, is within reach. However, among the costs of such growth are some of the world's worst pollution, which threatens not only the people's health and well-being, but also the country's image in the world and the government's legitimacy at home. Just one last thought. There are signs that an alternative model of development is emerging. There is more discussion of sustainable development at the top levels of the Chinese leadership than in almost any Western government, certainly than in the US. Incentives for industry and green jobs and innovation are significant. The stalled effort to create an annual green GDP to evaluate the environmental costs of economic development may be revived. The tight automobile economy standards are a credit to China. They're reconsidering some of the plans to build multiple dams on the New River in Wittenan. There's a possibility that China's preoccupation with face and national identity may yet be challenged may yet be channeled in support of an alternative model that the world has not yet seen. There may be some discussion of creating a green national identity. That may not be sufficient to shift the world onto a less damaging path. However, this discussion may be necessary at first steps. China may be able to resolve its environmental crisis by using technological leapfrogging and courageous policymaking to become a global leader in truly sustainable development. For this transformation to succeed, however, a national dialogue and effort to promote a green national identity will be required. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a brilliant presentation. I'm really pleased that, that you came to enlighten us with some of the, the history of one of the um, emerging economies, certainly the, the strongest and the most, the, the one is, which is emerging more uh, quickly. And I think I'll draw a bit on China, but I'll also broaden a bit. And I think you presented some of the great challenges that we're seeing. And uh, your first illustration, is, I think, is very good. When you're given an air conditioning, and you're actually, because the heating system was a history system based on coal, which is very, creates a lot of air pollution. And as we know today, it does create a million deaths in children. Half all the pneumonia deaths in children are from indoor air pollution, and creates a million COPD deaths, mostly in poor women in developing countries. So I think you hit a, a point there, in that there's, uh, the origin of uh, diseases is uh, intimately uh, connected to development. And uh, some of the thoughts that we're, we'll, I'm going to bring here are to do exactly with that. How is it that uh, the new uh, leap forward, great leap forward of the world today, which is the green economy, right? We're all in an economic crisis, and it, the green economy is put forward as the solution for the, that economic crisis, as well as to the climate change and the, the environment crisis that we live. So I think I'll bring some thought on the, how is it that emerging economies are relating to that in different ways. Um, I don't know how to operate this, which is probably the case now. Um, so I'll quickly go through, and I think I'll touch on two uh, elements that you brought up. One is the, the new leap forward, the green economy, and how is it that uh, that creates health and, or not or what opportunities are brought to health. And the other is what you were mentioning towards the end to do with um, international uh, ambitions or the international uh, reaching out to other countries in terms of development and what models could that bring and what we're seeing today and what does it all uh, could produce as a new model for, for development. Um, so what I'll, I'm going to start with some of the challenges that the developing countries, emerging economies, and the world, in fact, are facing. And the first one um, is non-communicable diseases. And although 
TB, HIV, AIDS, etc., big uh, problems. What we're seeing today is most countries, and the, the emerging economies in particular, are facing a massive amount of no disease, which is very, very well, uh, expensive to treat. So, in the kinds of efforts that have been made so far in terms of the prevention of those diseases, I'd say that they're very, very shy and very, very small in relation to what we're already doing, for example, in, in terms of infectious diseases, where we have a lot of uh, many more powerful strategies and a good history of uh, interventions. So we're searching for some of the responses for uh, NCD prevention. Certainly the tobacco convention is a very uh, good way forward. But we're very far from um, finding the response and really dwelling on the primary prevention of those diseases, I, I would argue. Um, the, in parallel to the um, epidemic and non-communicable diseases, you raise the fact that China is now the biggest contributor to uh, climate change gases. So it's not a minor issue. And although this may be seen as, you know, we also have the opportunity to pollute because we want to develop. The question is that they, the Chinese themselves and all the other emerging economies and everybody else is asking questions about what is legitimate and what can bring benefit to, to societies worldwide. So the onus of addressing climate change is not, you know, China is not out of that and not, not is Brazil or India or any of the other emerging economies, which are increasingly going to be the main contributors to, to, to climate change. Um, the, Climate change brings a number of health equity issues, and I'll just put some of them. Uh, uh, extreme weathers, especially in cities, for example, people die much more of um, heat strokes, and um, there's uh, areas which are, which are flooded, especially in coastal areas. Slums, for example, are especially vulnerable because of landslides. Uh, houses very vulnerable to extreme weather, and you have more strokes, more high. than that saved a year, only in the cities, in China. So it's, it's a major issue which is really not being integrated yet into the, the development uh, strategies. And traffic injuries, which is a major, completely avoidable, completely preventable, it depends on just the, what kinds of traffic do you have and what sort of transportation systems you, you're producing. Um, and while we're facing those problems, the kinds of solutions, the kinds of investments that we in the health sector are making, I illustrated that this is from OECD and some other research groups, it's not WHO data. But on the left you have what are the factors influencing health. You have a number of environmental factors and you have tobacco and alcohol and unsafe sex, which are the ones which we hear was the big, big factors which we know are very important. But there's a number of other ones where we make, and on the right column you're seeing the investments on the health sector, and they're all going to treat diseases. So there's a really a mismatch into where are the risks and where are the solutions that we are providing in the health sector. In part is that the health sector knows that the cause of disease lies outside the health sector. So in a way, is it our responsibility, is it not? So in that interface between uh, where are the sources of disease and how is it that the health sector could start engaging in primary prevention strategies with those other sectors, I think that lies the solution, perhaps, in the way forward for this new model, which would have to integrate environment and uh, public health and social well-being. And this is an example, I'll give you some examples now, which are positive examples, of uh, some of the emerging economies, because they are doing a lot of innovation. Um, and you pointed right that there's this vision about going green and, and uh, becoming more uh, sustainable. And um, this is in South Africa. There's an improvement by putting um, solar panels to heat the water in, in homes. Um, and we've done here, and I'll present some results, an analysis of what's being proposed for climate change mitigation by the IPCC, which is this big panel with two and a half thousand scientists. And they all say, well, these are the good policies for improving climate. Uh, they were considering mostly the climate change gases. They forgot that those same investments or those same efforts would also cause health or disease and social well-being or not, or social divide or not. And uh, I'm illustrating some of the examples here that we saw mostly in terms of inequalities. 
I mean, if you take transport again, um, what they are proposing mostly is, well, the greatest benefits would be better engines and better fuels and cleaner fuels, which, of course, is uh, correct. But with better engines and cleaner fuels, you still have injuries, you still have noise, you still have lack of physical activity. So in health terms, it doesn't do much good or it doesn't do enough good. Whereas if you take more integrated strategies for a rapid bus transit systems integrated with walking and cycling, you would have a mixture which would address not only the climate change question and the environment question, but also the public health, provide the public health solutions. Um, interestingly enough, the best examples of this uh, mixture of rapid bus transit systems, cycling and walking, are in Latin America. They're not in uh, Europe or in the US. And Colombia is a champion. Brazil some have, has some very good examples. And they're exporting that. Colombia now has a big uh, industry of exporting rapid bus transit systems to other places. They do it to perfection. So I just to say that uh, they are, these emerging economies are facing the challenges, but they are also finding the, the solutions. Uh, similarly, in terms of uh, energy efficiency in houses, which is uh, considered the big, the bigger, the largest source of the largest potential for uh, climate change gas reductions, is the housing sector. This is the low-hanging fruit from climate point of view. Now, there are some experiments, and you, I'll show you some of them. Uh, this is South Africa, where some slums are being retrofitted with improved houses, better insulation, uh, uh, solar systems to heat the water, etc. And they are using clean development mechanisms to fund that, which is the clean development mechanism is the way that the UNF, the UN Convention for Climate Change, has to fund uh, measures which protect from climate change. So the, the South Africans are managing in these slums to improve the housing of the slums, which improves uh, disease and uh, frequency, as well as to reduce climate. So we, we see this as a very good win-win. And this is back to your um, coal um, power uh, stove in, in China. As I said, this, it has a major impact on disease. But the interesting story, which perhaps is not told enough, is that China has implemented 180 million improved stoves in the 1990s to great success. And they've shown a reduction in lung cancer, for example, which was very dramatic. Coal has a lot of substances that lead to lung cancer, as well as improvement in other diseases. This is well demonstrated. Now, at the same time, we're seeing the rest of the world as half the world still uses this kind of cooking fuel. And we're not benefiting from the kinds of technologies that have been developed in China and that are being developed elsewhere. There's more recent technology in that. So uh, I'll say there. Another example, the, one, the first one on the left is China, is just using the same kind of combined systems for uh, heating water and heating the uh, indoor environment using solar panel. It's reasonably cheap. And the kinds of temperatures that the homes had before that were 6 to 8 degrees, and now they're sort of up to 18, 19 degrees, which has a huge difference for respiratory disease, uh, especially, and uh, children are very susceptible to that. But there's a number of diseases which are associated with the sort of bad weather conditions inside the home. Um, the uh, photograph on the right is about a program in India to change, uh, to replace kerosene lights for simple solar panel uh, technologies. Again, kerosene leads to burns, especially in children and women and leads to indoor air pollution. And there's, a good, there's good evidence, for example, for transmission, uh, increased transmission of tuberculosis in uh, homes which are heated with kerosene. Um, this is the Cape Town example of the slum, which has been, which has been improved with clean development mechanisms. And uh, we also know that healthcare facilities not only are very big users of energy, but 30% of the technologies in healthcare facilities are destroyed because of power outages. Uh, there's a lot of oscillation in the power systems in, in cities, and this is a big cause of damage for medical equipment. On the other extreme, we, have, we know we have 170,000 rural clinics we have, which have no access to electricity. Now, there are solutions for this solar panel, panel suitcases, for example, that you can use in these places, and simple devices that use uh, direct current and that can use uh, current from, currency, uh, current from uh, solar um, power that can provide electricity to these rural clinics. 
so we see in on the same time uh, in uh, hospitals in urban areas which have their own energy supply which is green or, or clean also are more, much more resilient because they're not um, submitted to or are liable to the kinds of uh, power oscillations that are in these urban areas. Uh, in, uh, I won't bore you with that, but there's a number of very good examples uh, in Latin America, in China, in India as well. In, in India has a, uh, they also are incorporating a number of other ways to improve the, in terms of medical waste, the, the medical facilities, medical waste, um, uh, uh, clean uh, rainwater harvesting, um, wastewater reuse systems. So all the technologies that we do know are being appropriated and used by the, by the health system are good examples. And why we don't do more of this really needs a historian to, and I, I would suggest that the historians here would take a, a dip into that. Because we focus a lot of our investments. We put mass, masses amount of money into vaccines, which are very good, and there's no doubt. But if you look at the cost effectiveness of an, a vaccine intervention, um, in, in terms of savings for every dollar spent, and you compare with improved uh, cook stoves or water sanitation and sustainable and active transport, and you see that we're talking of the same or the, the environment investments are either as good or better than, than the vaccine. So I think there's something that the historians may be able to illuminate us and why is it that the medical profession has not gone into this very low-hanging fruit which are the, the environment interventions. Um, I will just say, and I, I'm, I'm concluding here, uh, before I conclude, I'll just delve a bit into uh, what's needed to change that state of affairs. Uh, and what's, what's needed, we have the technology, we have the knowledge, we're concerned about the environment, about the social, about the inequalities, and we haven't put it all together. So my sense, or our sense in the Department of Public Health and Environment is that what's needed is that glue, that connection between where's the investments for climate, what is going to be a green economy, and, and public health. And so far, the green growth strategies from the OECD and the whole debate on the green economy has not incorporated the social. And that's a very major thing that I think that, and I see that possibly the BRICS and the emerging economies have more of an opportunity to, to develop, and that, that's their innovation. I do know that Brazil, in going for Rio Plus 20 next year, has a major concern in incorporating the social elements into sustainable, the sustainable development agenda, so I think that's very positive. We have been engaging a lot with uh, South Africa in terms of the preparations for the climate change summit next month uh, in December, again, the social, the connection between the environment and the social are very present. So I think we do have leadership and, and vision on that department. I'll mention uh, very briefly about the international scene and what we're seeing globally in terms of what is the outreach, the international development perspective of China, Brazil, uh, Russia, and I, uh, you know, I, it cannot be made, uh, we cannot have generalizations there, but I will um, bring about one element which I think is, I think for, on our perspective is coming true. China is in charge of doing a lot of the extraction of oil and of minerals in, in Africa, for example, today. Uh, there's a lot of concern by different people, there's a lot of benefits because people who are getting some resources and making use of their resources, but it has, also there's a, a cause for concern. And the lessons that we're drawing now is that with the kind of, we're not in the 19th century, and we don't have to do any wars to plunder resources any longer. I mean, this is, this is what happened, you know, with the colonial countries, the European countries in Africa uh, uh, in the 19th century. We're here at the moment where we do have a lot of knowledge of safeguards. How is it that we can do investment in ways that protect indigenous people, the environment, public health? And we do have in WHO, in the department, a specific kind of effort that goes and works with development banks and other development partners in, in creating those safeguards. I don't think, and this is a, an example of oil, we're developing this, you'll see this in the next seminar, I'll announce the next seminar already, uh, there, where we'll dwell a bit more on these issues of international development and how is that health can be included. But this is a, a little model that we're working with the development banks, 
and that's with the oil industry specifically. And I will say that, or conclude, that the, these emerging economies have the potential to do a model for international development which differs from the previous models. I think they are experimenting with it. Uh, China specifically, as you're referring to China, has not been using safeguards. I think they should, and I think they have a great opportunity for global public health if they were to do that. The tools are ready, the development banks are using, so it's not difficult and it's, not, it's, it's at it is an easy reach, and I do think it's a low-hanging fruit. Um, we, the other countries I explain with models of development which are different, and I think Brazil specifically in their climate change outreach in South America, uh, the climate change outreach is being done by the Minister of Social Development, not by the Minister of Environment. It's in connection with the Minister of Environment, but the criteria is we have to produce better climate responses, but in a way that responds to the inequalities and to public health and to other social concerns. So I uh, thank you for uh, your inspiration, and I, I hope I have convinced you to do a bit more work into why is it and what are the mechanisms that people could be adopting, the kinds of technology solutions and policy solutions that would address in an integrated ma uh, manner the um, uh, environment and the, the social, and I think public health is the ideal element to do that because we have the numbers and we have the um, capillarity. We are present in every community, so I think we do have the chance of showing not only doing better work, but showing that better work has been done and what is a good health performance for those kinds of interventions that uh, respond to the issues that you raise. I do think that we're the lessons from Chairman Mao, and it's not only him. I mean, you could have done the same thing for Russia and different things for, you know, for many countries have in their history. So I think the benefit of having also this kind of look in the past is to, to look at the future and see where is it that we can uh, avoid those mistakes. And I think the health does provide the glue for the social and the environmental and development. Thank you. Um, I'm David Clayton from the University of York, and I'm sort of going to moderate the, the discussion. Before I commence, um, just, a, just a quick note to ask you to use the, the microphones that are available on the desk uh, if you'd like to ask a question. Just press the button, and then once you finish, if you just press the button to, uh, to uh, close down the microphone. Um, I'd also like to sort of thank our kind of sponsors, uh, the Welcome Trust, uh, for its generosity. And um, I'd like to thank our sort of two, two speakers. And I'll, I'll begin by asking uh, a question to Professor Shapiro, um, just to get her back into sort of thinking about some of the, the points that she raised towards the end of the paper um, regarding um, the legacy of the Mao period and this, um, <coughs> this troubled legacy. Because as you rightly sort of note, uh, there has been a sort of sea change in China uh, the, the government is addressing sort of health uh, and sort of health inequalities, trying to sort of deal with sort of uh, long-standing uh, environmental kind of problems. Um, but what do you think the adverse legacy of the Mao eras will be for this sort of uh, strat really strategies of, sort of, mit of mitigation? The Mao era is a tough one for China. Um, the Communist Party's legitimacy rests on Mao still. Uh, they recently reissued a 100 yuan banknote that has Mao's face on the cover. If the Chinese people really were allowed to investigate all of the mistakes of Mao, including the Cultural Revolution, which I didn't even get to talk about, the responsibility would ultimately come all the way to the current leadership. So that there's a historical amnesia going on now um, where people are really not allowed to talk about what the deep cultural issues were that allowed that upheaval to occur um, and the, author the acceptance of authority. I mean, in a way, what you have now in China is the worst of dictatorship and the worst of democracy. 
because the, the central government, which understands these things, has actually decentralized a great deal of power to the provinces. And there's a lot of corruption and incentives to favor growth over sustainability in the middle levels. So you hear a lot of complaints about the middle level bureaucrats. So the dictatorship is not strong enough to implement the environmental laws. At the same time, at the grassroots, civil society is not strong enough. Although there's a lot of exciting developments here with protests and you know, use of social media and closing down of certain factories that wouldn't have been possible. But still, civil society groups are very much constrained and they can be shut down at any moment. So, you know, what is the legacy of the Mao period? <laughs> One of the legacies seems to be this man must conquer nature mentality, which I would argue is a, a modernization ethos that spans more than just China. A lot of the leaders of China today are former engineers. So they're still going for technocratic solutions. For example, with the falling aquifer that I talked about in North China, what are they doing? They're building three canals from the Yangtze River to the Yellow River to deliver water from the from the water um, abundance south to the water hungry north. But again, you're having human rights abuses and terrible environmental degradation. If they go for that western route that goes into Tibet, the environmental degradation will be terrible. So I don't know how well I've answered your question, but I, I, I think there has not been a strong break with that period. That we really need to understand what's going on today as a kind of um, a continuation of what happened then. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Just a very quick sort of, uh, follow-up question for, for, for Carlos Dor. Um, I mean, the, the Chinese example is kind of uh, is, is puzzling because there was, a, a, well, during the Maori, because it's both these sort of top-down, heavy, uh, capital-intensive sort of strategies to sort of change the way sort of technologies were being used, and lots of sort of uh, local sort of decentralized, labor-intensive sort of uh, schemes to, to raise kind of well-being ill-conceived at, at the time. Um, now, you, you raised some very interesting issues about sort of clean technologies, and there's a consensus that we need to sort of uh, um, diffuse these as quickly as possible. But what, is there any sort of strategy uh, forming related to the scale of interventions? Is it best, for example, to have interventions which set up uh, an electricity kind of grid in a slum, or is it best to kind of bring these sort of small-scale intermediate technologies to the household itself? Uh, because, again, this this can sort of take you back into some of the lessons of sort of a Chinese style kind of development? Sure. Good question. Um, first, it, it, it depends on the kind of policy. You cannot do better transport in the home, so you know that it's courses for courses. And, but the scale will be the city, which would be appropriate. What I think is missing more than the scale is the, um, the spirit of going for and testing the new technologies for what their impacts are. And I think if, if I just give you the, I mean, my previous. One of the things that we do have is this business of doing health impact assessments and strategic impact assessments. If you just do that, we can see which of these green technologies are good and which ones, which ones do not help people very much. So it's not that difficult. We have those kinds of, that kind of knowledge. But I think there hasn't been enough uh, effort, the clean cook stoves, for example, and we're now looking into doing better cook stoves with better household, household water treatment and with vector control. I mean, those are simple interventions. People have not been yet testing it to scale in not testing the, the new technology. So I think it's more the idea of creating safeguards that how, looking at the perspective or the, the technology which are going to be tested and decided that we're going to evaluate them and to assess them and to look into what, what are the potential implications and to create risk management and ways, systems that allow us to improve the performance for health of those investments, be it reducing risks for health and improving risk for health. So I think what's needing is this research effort that focuses on that kind of where are the, the big impacts. And I think there's a job for the the medical research councils, the welcome councils, but also the, the Chinese, the Brazilian, the, the South African research councils. Thank you very much. I think uh, one of the points to sort of uh, to bear in mind that stems from 
uh, Judith's kind of presentation is that these kind of uh, practices of, of trialing and piloting sort of uh, technologies and schemes can involve sort of local people. So it can be part of this kind of processes of sort of political participation to get people behind these kind of uh, initiatives. Oh, hello, my name is Regina Unger. I work for KMS. I coordinate a program called ePortuguese. Well, it's more than a comment than a question, but uh, and I hope I can be coherent in what I'm going to say. I know that most of the time we are always looking into the BRICS or the big countries like the United States, Canada, China, Brazil, etc. But I think that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Evolution showed us, that, I mean, a long time ago, we, people who didn't know about the solar energy and green uh, power, etc., etc. So we were supposed to use uh, what we had at the moment, which was uh, fuel, uh, water, uh, using all those things that uh, you're using, that we've been using, until we developed the green uh, energy. Well, my, my, my comment is, we already know those things are good, we already know those, those things work, and, it's already, it's, and it is very difficult to implement that in a country like Brazil for its size, or China, or the United States. It goes, it, it does happen, but it, it is little. Why don't we, as a global community, have a responsibility with these smaller countries? Like countries that are so small that sometimes they even don't count. In the, main, in the numbers of population or in the pollution that they do. For instance, uh, one of the smallest countries in the world is Santo Man Principe, two islands in the coast of Africa, Guinea coast, it's a Portuguese speaking country. And I just arrived from there, and one of the biggest uh, aim is to have a, a, a generator. So that in the cities, or in the library, or in the, or in the hospital, they would have energy 24 hours a day. Shouldn't we be responsible knowing that it's such a small country, such a small number of 160,000 people, it fits the Maracanã state, state, uh, stadium, the whole population. I mean, shouldn't we be responsible for helping them to uh, use this green energy now? It's, uh, how many, how much should we need to, I mean, supply a country, a small country like that, like many others, with the green energy so that it would develop, not going through all the development that we did in the Western world, like we go from that to, 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 to gas, to uh, kerosene, etc., etc. Shouldn't we they skip that stage for those countries and help them go straight to the green, uh, to the green energy? That wouldn't that be better, we as a... As I said, it's a comment, not necessarily a question. Secondly, I can give you my examples for six years in India that they come across something solar and it just doesn't go any place anymore. They've done it and it's all over. And, it's for, and the worst of our part of this there's no militarism. You know, look at the United States right now, with tens of millions of people being thrown out of their houses. We don't seem to have any counterpoise to do something instead of just saying, gee, that's too bad, you know? By the way, I just want to say one thing, Madame Shapiro. Uh, dictators, you know, you, you are always bad for nature. Stalin wasn't very good for it either, you know? <laughs> okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I'll sort of res respond to those kind of ob observations rather than kind of questions, and then sort of Carlos and Judith be more than welcome to, to, to come in. I think uh, with, with respect to kind of, uh, there is a sort of issue of, sort of scale here. With respect to kind of small places, actually, the market incentives for, for sort of uh, profit-seeking companies to bring in sort of technologies are going to be weaker than for large, for large economies. So in small places, there may be kind of a greater propensity for sort of states to get involved to cover some of these kind of uh, these costs of, as you say, sort of leapfrogging from old technologies into sort of new technologies, but this must happen, and it must happen kind of quickly. So my, my hunch is that for places which are small, where the market incentives for, for companies to kind of to sell products and to trial products are, are weaker, they may have to have sort of stronger sort of state in, interventions. Uh, but these big state interventions clearly kind of uh, can go horribly wrong, uh, in, in, particularly in large states. 
have another kind of question, I think, coming in, or maybe another observation. Hi, I'm Maya. I'm a medical student, and I'm an intern here. I um, I recently read a piece by an academic who said that they thought that the Chinese one-child policy should be included in their mitigation activities because population growth is such a big threat to climate change. And I wondered what you two thought about including population policies in climate change mitigation. Over to Judith, first of all. Now it's on, but I'm finished talking. <laughs> I, I think I would just like to add to what the leapfrogging story. And of course, that's the obvious thing to do. That we should be leapfrogging. Why is it that we should be dwelling on, on and insisting on technology? I think what, we, the, what we're needing to do more is to create the opportunities for leapfrogging. And at the moment, it's very difficult for populations like slum dwellers. I mean, this is a rare example that South Africa managed to have green development mechanisms, money to, to, to improve slum dwellers. I mean, of four and a half thousand applications, only 14 were to do with improving poor housing in, in some of the developing countries. So I think there's a big, uh, the step to take is not that the, the new technologies are available uh, in clinic, rural clinics, etc. would need that and would benefit very much. But uh, the present mechanisms for finance in the uh, CDM or in the, the climate finance have not allowed for those kinds of one broader benefits, like uh, benefits to public health are not included. You can be doing a lot of good socially and that's not counted. I mean, so that's one of the issues that will have to be revisited. And I would say that that's a topic for the Durban negotiations now in December. Uh, and the other is having some criteria, some way of packing these kinds of interventions in bundles, in groups, so they can be taken to the, the climate negotiation and the, the finance mechanism. So I think there's some work to be done on massaging the um, finance, make climate finance, to allow for those kinds of issues to come forward. And I think one, one practical solution would be that just, for example, that health sector in December in Durban proposes that we should be doing um, monitoring reporting and verification of health impacts, not only on uh, the climate change gases uh, changes. So, I mean, that in itself could create a whole different dynamic in terms of incorporating that dimension of health and social into climate change debates. I think we need a seminar about population, and I don't think we'll venture into response to this now. Uh, just to join on to population, I, mean, I think this, this, just from a from the perspective of what, what lessons there are from the Chinese experience. I think it's, the lessons are bad ones. As so, uh, Judy said, that there should have been sort of population control in the 1950s sort of and 60s. The technologies were there, and the simple technologies regarding sort of family, family planning, creating incentives for people to have lower families because there were more children that were going to survive because infant mortality rates are sort of falling. So you can use education, so very sort of simple sort of technological in, in interventions. Uh, you don't need this kind of uh, one child per family kind of uh, draconian sort of solution. And many Chinese societies went through the demographic transition uh, on, a, on a sort of, a, and, and, timed it, and timed it well, notably kind of Hong Kong. So fertility rates kind of fell very kind of quickly in the 1960s, 1970s, after very sharp falls in infant mortality rates. So there's better examples in the Chinese world for how to sort of get to sustainable levels of population growth, which is without question key aspect of environmental kind of uh, control because people are part of nature. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Michaela Pfeiffer, and I, I work with Carla Stora on a lot of the strategic health impact assessment, and in particular, uh, I am focused on the extractive industries work and, to some extent, on the health sector activities. And I just wanted to make a comment more than a question that kind of added on to, to what Carlos was saying around what needs to happen um, and, and w one of the core areas that WHO is focusing on through its health focus within the green economy is around making the health sector aware of these opportunities that are provided by environmental interventions because this is a key gap that the health sector needs to understand that this is the, the social benefit, this is the financial return, this is the health and disease avoided, and that there's a huge opportunity provided by the clean development mechanisms, by the climate change agenda, by the green economy. And so there's a big focus on bringing them in to that debate. Alice, would you like to respond to those observations? Uh, I think I would like probably to do an extra one in terms of how do we get our gaps to these poor countries or the, even the smaller ones. And, and I think the new players on the field are the, the BRICS. And they are doing now certainly a lot of massive foreign direct investment, but they're also starting to do uh, de international development. And I think a big uh, opportunity that exists in how, what's the model for international development that they're going to be adopting. Um, the usual development partners have the DAC and the Paris Declaration, and it has been working together on the, how do you do uh, international development, how do you relate to smaller economies, to poor countries, etc., and how do you tame, if you want, foreign direct investment to make sure that you have benefits, social benefits. I think that the enormous opportunity exists for these new countries, and I think they could be providing a kind of model that would integrate much more. Um, and possibly, uh, I, I know that, for example, that China has been visiting a number of other uh, foreign international development agencies and discussing how do you do development, etc. And I'm sure that, that the others are possibly in the process of doing the same thing. So I see that as a health in foreign policy and health in international development connected to the green economy, to the, the sustainable development agenda, would be a, a very um, obvious uh, place to focus the, the new development partners, if you want, uh, coming from development partnerships coming from, from the big countries. I'd like to just mention um, a dynamic in Chinese development that just hasn't come up yet. Um, I know I said in my remarks, I mentioned this term, displacement of environmental harm. But China has a, a Develop the West campaign going on right now, targeted at the Muslim areas and the Tibetan areas, and to uh, an extent in Mongolia and some of the poorer areas in the West. And this development, Develop the West campaign is not being very well received, I should say. It seems as if a lot of times roads and infrastructure are being built in order to facilitate extraction of resources to the developed coastal areas. And especially given the fact that these are ethnic minority areas which are already un unhappy with Han rule, this is not a very encouraging model. Um, on the one hand, you would think that the government is trying to decrease some of the extreme inequalities um, of income. But, um, it, you know, we talk about Wallerstein and the center and periphery and all this. It seems like a kind of the periphery, it's almost like a um, colonial kind of a situation where you sometimes wonder why are they holding on to Tibet when the Tibetans really don't want to be held on to. And, and you know, now with the railroad, they say, the Chinese are saying, oh, we brought development to Tibet. But in fact, what's happened with the railroad is now they can get access to some of these rare earths and other materials, and they can bring troops all the way up to the Indian border. So it's not, I mean, uh, forgive me with any Chinese people in the room who might disagree with me, but it doesn't seem from the Tibetan perspective as if this development is doing much good for the Tibetan people. Well, I should just say that. <laughs> um, thanks, you. I think that's a point well made, and um, it reinforces your your thesis regarding kind of the, the importance of um, sort of grassroots kind of organisations getting involved in, in all kind of development sort of schemes, whether they're kind of sort of defined as kind of sustainable 
or, or, or not. Um, I was just, as a, I was just wondering. I mean, I, I agree with you. Um, you, you. You talk to local people. You you talk to them about what they know uh, before you sort of make any decisions. Um, that, that that model seems to work very very well when the the environmental problems, if you like, air pollution, um, sort of water pollution, are sort of local, local, are tangible, can be can be measured. Um, do you think you do you think this kind of solution can sort of deal with kind of more global sort of trans kind of uh, border problems? I mean, kind of kind of global civil society kind of emerge uh, to feed into sort of uh, global level decision making, and can Chinese kind of people possibly participate in that type of activity? There really are very, very exciting things going on in civil society in China now. There was a time I was good friends with uh, uh, a guy who founded the first Chinese NGO, Friends of Nature, and he recently passed away. But he used to tell me, that was founded in 1994, and he used to tell me, you know, our members are always looking for something to participate in, but the only thing we can do that's safe is pick up garbage and plant trees, you know, and maybe we talk about preventing protecting the Tibetan antelope, because in that case, most of the poachers were Tibetan and the government was, for whatever reason, comfortable with that campaign. Um, but the, num the numbers of the, sort of the range of strategies available, it's just extraordinary. And um, there's a Greenpeace China now that's hanging banners and doing protests. There are not only educated elite people who are get getting educated in the West and then going back to join Greenpeace including one of my graduate students who was quoted in the paper just the other day about the middle classes and the use of uh, you know, internet technologies to organize. Um, but also farmers are starting to be aware that if their village is a cancer village, then they should go to court. Instead of thinking they have to travel to Beijing and put a petition at the gate of the Central Committee, which used to be you know, the only way to get your grievances redressed or find a journalist who could be persuaded to write an article about your problem. But now, you know, there's this notion, oh, we should sue them. And so there's really some interesting changes in the use of the courts and also in the use of these public strategies. I w should also say that there's a lot of alliances between people at the government officials at the top level and certain civil society groups. So Greenpeace China wouldn't operate in this way if the central government were looking for support in some ways in pressuring these middle-level bureaucrats. So they talk about having a mother-in-law. You have to register, and the government agency has to be your guarantor. Um, so all of these civil society groups have some kind of government um, approval. Thank you. That's very illuminating. Um, another question. I'm Susan Wilburn, and I also work with Carlos in Interventions for Healthy Environments, mostly looking at the health sector, uh, protecting health workers and greening in the health sector. And this, this conversation about the role of civil society triggers me to raise the issue and ask you both to comment on the fact that often the, um, the push towards green energy and green technologies has ignored the fact of the risk to the workers who are building those technologies and that we're just evolving into a, a discussion where green development includes safe and healthy for the workers and for the communities in which those production plants might live and avoid the contamination of the toxic chemicals and metals that are used in the building of solar panels, for example. And so I, I'm interested to hear from, from you, Carlos, about where the worker health perspective fits into the social and environmental safeguards, and from Dr. Shapiro about the role of independent trade unions in modern China and how how um, trade union activism can be um, uh, can be channeled in terms of, of green development. There's um, government approved trade unions. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much the trade union movement. Um, some years ago, uh, an activist named Han Shaogong was uh, arrested and has been working out of Hong Kong the last time I saw. So. There's not much of an independent uh, trade union movement in China. It's not 
quite possible, ironically, given the dictatorship of the proletariat and all of that. Um, but you're perfectly right about the toxic conditions in the production of solar panels and um, the latest demonstration that I read about, which was last week, was a, at a solar panel uh, plant. And also there's a lot of attention given to toxicity in the mining of rare earths, which are used in solar panels. Uh, I have a student who's um, researching that right now. Now, ironically, though, I, sometimes the Chinese government uses the environment as a cloak for repression. And they've done that quite a bit with a, what they call an ecological migration campaign, where they're basically asking nomads in the peripheral areas to settle down. This is a classic, I don't know if you know James Scott's work. And, you know, the state doesn't like nomads because they wander all over the place and you can't control them. So the Chinese have been trying to get, the Han have been trying to get the nomads to settle down for a long time. Well, now they're saying it's the nomads, um, the animals with their sharp hooves, that are responsible for the desertification uh, and the overgrazing. And uh, so in the name of the environment, they are basically asking minority nationalities to give up their cultures. So that's really um, sad to me, very sad. So. Uh, thank you for bringing this up, Susan. I think the occupational health we didn't bring here, um, it is one of the key safeguards. And um, it's, if you look at any of the development bank safeguards, occupational health and safety is, is one of the issues. But I think it's fair to say that this push for green growth, etc., or the push for growth, um, if you want construction in China primarily, I mean, it's much bigger than the other emerging economies, it's also big in the other emerging economies, but it's been done with asbestos. Now, we do know that asbestos is carcinogenic. We do know that there are safe substitutes. And nonetheless, I think because of lack of awareness or lack of regulation, or you name it, but the legacy of that for cancer in the occupation cohort of people who are constructing those houses, and then the people who are going to repair those houses in the future, is pretty massive and very substantial. So um, it's the kind of thing that if we were more present in the occupational health actors and the, the health actors uh, around other sectors and working more closely with construction or with uh, building and development, we could be avoiding not only not only providing health now, but you know avoiding also this legacy in the future. So uh, absolutely, uh, I think there's the kinds of safeguards provided, and they do include indigenous people. Uh, occupational health and safety, um, gender rights. I mean, there's a number of issues. There's eight safeguards, if you know, if you know, one of them is community health and safety. But I think a uh, point very well made. Um, well, can I just run things off and uh, sort of thank our uh, speakers, uh, Professor Shapiro and uh, Carlos Dora, for excellent uh, thought-provoking sort of papers. Uh, and all the participants of, of the, the webinar who've sort of asked some, some pressing kind of questions which have forced the kind of speakers to think about the linkages between the, the past and, and the present, as always in these settings. And can I thank our sponsors once again, sort of the Welcome uh, Trust, and just flag up sort of the next kind of uh, webinar, which will be on the 2nd of November on the subject of asbestos control. And the speakers will be Linda Waldman from the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex, and uh, Ivan Ivanov from the World Health Organization. So can I thank you all again? Much appreciated. Thank you.